Okay, good morning and welcome to uh, the third and last day of the conference and apologies for the slight delay. Uh, so yeah, I hope you've been enjoying all the talks in the event and you managed to have uh, a good night's sleep, including those of you like me who have been following the UK elections to wake up to some interesting results. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about during the, the coffee breaks and lunch break. Uh, but for the time being, I am very delighted to introduce uh, our second keynote uh, speaker, uh, Professor Rosalind Gill from City University uh, in London. Uh, and uh, Rose is a professor of social and cultural analysis uh, she researches various interconnected areas, including media, intimacy, gender, sexuality, surveillance, work, and academia. Uh, and her most recent book, books are Aesthetic Labor, Beauty, Politics in Neoliberalism with Anna Elias and Christina Scharf, and Mediated Intimacy, Sex Advice in Media Culture with Meg John Barker and Laura Harvey. And she's currently editing a volume about cultural hubs and writing another book on gendered neoliberalism. Uh, and today, uh, Rose will be talking to us about contemporary beauty apps and sex, sex apps as two significant genres of self-tracking. She will be looking at the gendered dimensions of these apps, questioning how such technologies are reshaping body image, subjectivity, and intimate life. So without further ado, I would like to invite Rose to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tihaj, and apologies for being late. It's completely my responsibility, and I'm sorry to delay everything. Um, yeah, I, I s slept at 5 a.m., um, <laughs> and yes, well, more on that later. So it's uh, thank you so much for inviting me, Tihaj. Thank you for a wonderful conference. It's been such a great pleasure to hear so many interesting presentations and to meet so many wonderful people. I've been really enjoying the conference um, so far and looking forward to today. So these are some of the apps that I'm, I want to be talking about with you today, um, apps that allow you to capture, analyze, modify, <laughs> improve, be hotter, be thinner, be sexier, all these kinds of apps um, that I'll be coming on to talk about. Um, but I want to start by talking a little bit about where I come from in terms of my questions, because I wasn't, I guess, like most people in the room, I wasn't always interested in metric culture. And actually, my questions come from much kind of older and longer term um, sets of questions. And so really, like what animates all my research is questions about power, questions about inequality, questions about social justice. So. I don't want to kind of be too mesmerized by me metrics in and of themselves, but I'm more interested in the way that they kind of um, intersect or bisect or integrate or um, materialize in fields that are already deeply marked by power and deeply marked by inequalities and injustices. My background is in psychosocial studies and in cultural studies, and my work's very much influenced by feminist work and by queer theory and by critical race scholarship. And I'd say, you know, if there was one question that, that kind of animated everything that I do, it's really an interest in the relationship between culture and subjectivity. So it's questions about how it is that what is out there gets in here. Um, and starts to shape who we are, how we feel, um, how we uh, move around and relate in the world. So it's really a question about the psychic life of capitalism that, um, that deeply interests me. Um, I'm very fortunate to be in the room with so many luminaries in this field um, and to have learned from the work of so many people here and I guess one of the profound debts I, I have is to Deborah Lupton. So it was a great pleasure to hear you and to meet you. Um, and one of the, the first things I read around these issues was the distinctions that you started making between private, voluntary, pushed, coerced kinds of engagements with self-tracking. Um, I'm also really interested in questions of surveillance. Um, and not simply surveillance by the state, which I guess is how we think about it mostly, or increasingly surveillance by Google, <laughs> Apple, by the Facebook, by our big companies. Um, but 
I'm interested more generally in what Mark Andrejevich calls the way that the surveillance imaginary is expanding vertiginously. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in those forms of surveillance that we actually, actually often opt into voluntarily um, rather than being imposed on us. And I'm also interested in new modalities of power and the way in which governing as T. Hajj has put it, has been recast as a technical rather than a political activity in which big data and micro-measurement both play a key part. And that leads to questions about what kinds of ethical selves we become, what kinds of new modes of seeing and living um, do we start to experience and trying to raise critical questions about neoliberalism, about power, about resistance. And I'm going to very briefly speak about four different areas of my work that touch on metrics. Um, and then I'm going to focus mainly on the, the last area, which is around appearance surveillance. So I'm going to just start briefly by saying something about academia, and then sex tracking, and then psycho apps, and then mainly focus on appearance. So I think, you know, if to start anywhere, we can start right in our own backyard, as Andrew Ross would put it. Um, we can start with academia as a toxic metric culture. Um, and over the last 10 years or so, I've been writing quite a lot about the hidden injuries of, of um, neoliberal academia, which are becoming less and less hidden and more and more <laughs> brought into the light, although somehow no more easy to resist for the fact that they're more visible and more talked about now. And I really love this quote from Mark Spooner, where he says, sometimes the antagonist isn't wielding a gun. In this kind of attack, there's no person or event that can be met head on with a protest or a strike. There's no expulsion, no great conflict, no epic battle. Such is the case with higher education's silent killer, the slow incremental creep of audit culture. I think that, that puts it really <laughs> brilliantly um, and captures the sort of insidiousness of it um, and that difficulty of actually being able to identify and fight back against whatever the enemy is. Um, Les Back has written a wonderful book in the last year um, called Academic Diary, which I highly recommend that you read. Um, and he, he also talks about this, talks about higher education being disfigured by cultures of audit and commercialization. Oh. <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> um, so yeah, dis discipline and publish. Um, <laughs> as Foucault might have written if he was working in UK academia today, perhaps. Um, so Roger Burroughs has talked about the way that metrics have entered into academic culture and the fact that UK academics are now measured and ranked on more than 100 different scales and indices, which nest together. And he talks about nested assemblages um, and metric assemblages that rank us. So our, um, our student feedback, our PhD completions, our publications, our citations, um, our Google Scholar ratings, um, our number of downloads on academia.edu. There's just so many of these. And more and more, they've been kind of um, monetized and also put into um, a very, very serious relationship to power within the academy so that these things take on a life of their own. They actually do things. They're not just numbers or you know abstract figures. They, they mat have material effects. They close down courses. You know, if the numbers aren't right, that course will shut. We've just had it happen to us at City. Our, our course is just closed. Um, and they, they make people redundant. They have really material effects. And as Chris Shaw has written, they have a really corrosive effect on our professionalism and on our autonomy. Um, Butterwick and Dawson say they incite a regime of document everything, reveal nothing, <laughs> make yourself calculable rather than memorable. 
Um, and I, I'm very interested with my kind of psychosocial background in what that does to us, how, what it does to the way that we see ourselves, but also what it does to the way that we relate to others and how we start relating to people. And a lot of people in the UK are very interested in the way that it, it has shifted over the last few years so that initially it was when we had the RAE, the research assessment exercise, um, initially it was felt as this kind of alien thing that was being imposed on us from the outside and what's happened over this creeping period of 20 years is that it's been taken in, we've really taken it in and um, started to talk about it as if it were something meaningful, started to organise our lives around um, responding to those metrics. Um, it was a fantastic paper in a, by two feminist geographers a couple of years ago and they, they asked the question, how many papers is a baby worth? Um, this was a fantastic question and a very, very pertinent question and a question that actually needed an answer because in our research excellence framework, um, you get sort of certain dispensations for being an early career researcher. You can't be expected to have published as much as a, you know, someone who's been in academia for decades, if you're right at the start of your career. If you've had sick leave, if you've had maternity leave, you will get certain kind of um, dispensations. And they wrote this paper at the time before it had been decided what that was. So it was really a very real question how many papers is a baby worth? Um, just one, actually. That's the answer. <laughs> just one paper. So I'd take the baby over the paper or any, you know, no hands down contest. Um, and Erin Duffy and oh, Stephen Pooley, I think, have just written a, a great paper. I've just read before I came here. Um, and they update, and you may know Helen Blair's work, which is around precarious workers and uh, interviews with them where they said, oh, you're only as good as your last job. And they've updated that for academia and said, you're only as good as your Google citation score or your academia.edu ranking. Um, and it's very, very striking to me to see the way that um, these metrics have entered into the life world of the academy. They've, they're absolutely no longer just out there. They're, they've morphed into this kind of thing of continuous surveillance. So we have these kind of surreal notions of something like refability, like is someone refable or is an item refable? Um, so although nominally we're in this kind of one point surveillance every six years or so. In fact, this animates our lives all the time. So there's questions, so m and many questions about, well, how do we resist this? Um, and I, I love this quote by Davison Bansell saying, the practices of accountancy cannot recognize or countenance anyone who sees their job as responsibly working against the grain of dominant discourses, of asking dangerous questions of government, opening up spaces of difference where new possibilities might emerge. The single most important feature of neoliberal government is that it systematically dismantles the will to critique. And I think that's such an important insight by them. But people are thinking about critiquing. Um, Again, there's a fantastic feminist geography collective. Um, they've published under the name Mounts et al, um, who talk about, let's count things differently. Let's count alternative things. We could count thank you notes that we've received from students. We could count the friendships that we've made. We could count the collaborations that we've forged with other people. Um, and Les Back also t talks about counting differently. Um, Judith Jack Halberstam talks about the queer art of failure um, as a way of subverting established regimes and values. And there are lots and lots of different critical interventions. Um, I just want to show you one very amusing one. I don't know if anyone's seen this, <laughs> but um, I like the, the founding principle of the Journal of Universal Rejection is rejection, universal rejection. That is to say, all submissions, regardless of quality, will be rejected. <laughs> <laughs> Despite that apparent drawback, here are a number of reasons you may choose to submit to the J of UR. 
you can send your manuscript here without suffering waves of anxiety regarding the eventual fate of your submission, you know with 100% certainty that it will not be accepted for publication. There are no page fees. You may claim to have submitted to the most prestigious journal, judged by acceptance rate. <laughs> The JFUR is one of a kind. Merely submitting your work to it may be a badge of honour. Um, you retain complete rights to your work when you submit to it. None of that sort of open access, green gold, sign stuff away. Um, you're free to resubmit to other journals even before their, re their review process is um, complete. And decisions are often, though not always, rendered within hours of submission. So that's a great satire I think that most people can relate to. Another one, I don't know if people have seen this, but um, this is an imagination of Karl Marx going for his end of year departmental assessment. Um, so I just see, let's hope this works. Ah, Dr. Marx. Good to see you. Thanks for coming in for this assessment. Hi. So Carl, I really like what you did, with what was it, Das Capital? Great stuff. Thanks. I aim to please. In terms of impact points it scored very highly. Very highly indeed. Great what you did with the whole 20th century, those revolutions and whatever. Massive impact points there. Right. Thanks. But, obviously not a peer-reviewed document. So I can't. Count it towards your publications for the REF assessment. And that's kind of a problem. Oh? I mean, a man can't live on impact alone, if you know what I mean? And departmentally, I'm sorry to say you're just not pulling your weight in terms of publications. Well, what about the Communist Manifesto? That had a lot of citations. That falls into the same trap I'm afraid, Carl. It doesn't help the REF at all. Where's the new work? Well, well, I... I got a little bogged down with some of the new administrative duties. Seriously? Yeah, I mean, some of the... What are you? A posy or something? But don't you agree that the managerialization of education destroys the possibility of independent thought? We're in this together, Carl. We're all in the same boat with that. You think you're special? No, I just thought. Now what about the matter of your student evaluations? Not so hot, Carl. The online module evaluation shows, how shall I put this? Well, you're letting your customers down, Carl. Really letting them down. They're paying for a service and they want value. Value for money. But, but... That's exactly what I'm trying to show. I mean look at this one at random, I quote. Professor. Marx didn't use PowerPoint and he didn't email us his notes. Afterward. Typical. But it's completely t I won't play all of it, but um, I think it's a, it's a brilliant, um, yeah, it's a brilliant satire. And it's by the Department of Omni Shambles. Um, so you can find it on YouTube. Um, Omni Shambles was taken from a, a TV show that uh, was sort of about like constant <laughs> mistake making within government. And so they use that um, as their name. So just moving on to, to talk about the second area of interest that I've got, which is around mediated intimacy. So as part of this work I've been doing with Meg John Barker and Laura Harvey, we've been looking at sex apps and looking at what happens when you start to kind of metricize sex? Um, and we're locating that within a kind of longer term shift, uh, which precedes these kinds of, of quantified measures, um, which is around um, the way that we're incited to start thinking about our sex lives in terms of kind of entrepreneurial values. So we start to think about our most intimate relationships through the lens of market logics, of consumerism, of investing, um, and of being enterprising. And um, Deborah Lupton's done some great work around the quantified self of sex that's emerging. Um, and Ms. Melissa Tyler talks about how it's no longer enough to be 
doing it, you need to be working at it, managing it, improving it, and of course, counting it. So it raises just all kinds of questions about what this does to our ideas of sexual relationships. Um, and one of the, th the things that it does, of course, is it just entrenches the idea that it's yet one more area of our life world that um, it's our responsibility to track. Um, we've, in our book, we've, it spans across all kinds of media. This is just one small part, but we've looked at some of the different genres of sex apps and we've kind of identified five different kinds of sex apps. Um, and by far the most common seem to be the calendar and tracking apps, which show your averages, the types of sex you're having, weekly, monthly, annual statistics. Um, so mysexualator.com is, it presents itself as a virtual personal sexual assistant, not a digital assistant, a sexual assistant that helps you keep track in the sack, tells you how much you're having, where improvements can be made. Um, interestingly, I watched a, a sort of hour long YouTube interview with the woman who developed this app and it was very much framed as a kind of tool that you could use within a couple um, to help arbitrate in arguments about how much sex you are having, um, which was extraordinary to me, really. <laughs> um, another one is Sex Tracker by Naughty, which um, allows users to record when, where, with whom, how long, what protection was used, and, and various other customizable features. And there's been um, a lot of discussion about the way that sex tracking intervenes in a, a highly gendered and a highly heteronormative space. Um, so I'm sure some of you followed the debates when the iPhone 5 came out, um, when the sex tracker was under the reproductive health tab, um, which by definition entrenched the kind of idea of sex and contraception as, as women's responsibility. Um, as well as missing out, you know, most, most sex that isn't reproductive sex, um, all forms of um, gay and queer sex, um, all forms of kind of non-penetrative sex and so on. Um, so there's been that sort of idea that sex um, becomes kind of labelled as women's responsibility, um, but also there's many, many apps that are very much targeted at men um, that have a very kind of laddish and playerish kind of feel. Um, one of them I came across is called Black Book Did It, and um, it allows you to record information and photos from each notch on your bedpost and helpfully allows recording of other data such as how trashed you were during the encounter um, so a very different feel from some of the more kind of scientific tracking apps. Then there are these other types of apps, the Spice Advice, Gameplay and Analysis apps, the Spice apps. Um, they do something that, you know, a lot of women's magazines and men's magazines f doing this, this book on mediated intimacy. I'm, I'm signed up to all kinds of um, reminders and um, media and I like one of the things I get is a, a bulletin from Men's Health Daily telling me what my sex position of the day should be. Um, and Cosmo has that as well. Um, Love Sparks gamifies your, your sex life. Um, and it's interesting because in the blurb about the app, it says turning your sex life into a to-do list may not sound sexy, but if gamification has upped your fitness levels, imagine what it can do for your relationship. So it gives you ideas for quickies, different locations, different role play fantasies, um, those sorts of things. And it also, interestingly, it has sort of levels that you can progress through in that kind of classic game um, function. So you can kind of um, increase complexity, intimacy, strength. Um, many of them, like the couple foreplay sex game, also allows you to move through levels. So you start off on the novice level and you can pro progress to the master level. Um, and then the analysis apps that are really fast developing at the moment, again, building from sleep monitoring technologies. They measure movement, they measure heart rate, sounds. So they purport to offer you an analysis of your sex life, an actual analysis, um, much in the way that they analyze the quality of your sleep. You have to set them up, you have to kind of calibrate them against the, the firmness of the mattress that you're on or whatever surface you're on. Um, and then it will give you um, an analysis of your sex life. 
third type of app that I'm really interested in um, are the, the sort of psycho apps, the psych apps. So I'm personally at the moment absolutely fascinated by the sort of turn to positive psychology. Um, really enjoyed, where's Chris Till? Really enjoyed his talk yesterday. Um, and partly out of my work on academia, got really interested in the way that, say, occupational health departments of universities, are out because the, the kind of volume of um, problems that people are bringing to them, because we're all so overworked, precarious, um, you know, really, really stressed out, because so many people are turning to occupational health, counselling departments, that they've actually started turning to apps. And so you can go to these sort of resilience training courses and then they'll send you off home or back to your office with a resilience app that'll help you basically cope with the uncopable, um, you know, make, make your workload, make an unbearable workplace bearable by using these kinds of apps. Confidence apps are another area, highly gendered, really targeted at women and something I'm interested in uh, very much as well. But Oh yes, and, and resilience apps, I'm fascinated by the way that they're moving younger and younger. Um, so I saw this positive penguins one, trying to teach very young children um, about resilience. And then this idea that you could be kind of doing real-time feeling monitoring, which is something that Will Davis is writing about at the moment, that kind of exhortation to all of us in s across so many spaces to be constantly monitoring our mood or our feelings. So, you know, you, can, you can't really make a purchase without somebody kind of like phoning you up and asking you how was your experience of making that purchase. You can't walk through the airport without somebody saying how was your experience of security today and you've got your four emojis to, to choose from. And many of the apps targeted at children around these psycho technologies um, use this kind of um, idea, use, use different faces. Um, oh, yes, and this, I just had to bring this in because, ah, th I think we're trialling this in London. So IKEA have a trialling this motivational mirror. So it has this algorithm in and basically you walk past it and it, it pays you a compliment. And I've read the press release about this. So they sort of have this, all this kind of you know, spurious data around most people experience a dip in confidence around 9.30 in the morning, interestingly, um, <laughs> especially after a general election. No, um, <laughs> but um, and so how great to have the confidence mirror or the motivational mirror. Um, it's uh, on sale in the Wembley branch in London. Um, anyway, moving on to appearance apps. So I wanted to locate my discussion of these appearance apps in a, in a broader context of the really, really intensive and extensive surveillance of women's bodies in our culture. And I think really, I don't think Sanjay's here today, but I think it really um, resonates with what he was talking about in terms of whiteness yesterday and the wearable whiteness of, of being that um, really wanting to ask questions about the way that gender gets encoded into these technologies as well. And 10 years ago, I wrote surveillance of women's bodies constitutes perhaps the largest type of media content across all genres and media forms. And that's really, really dramatically intensified over the last decade. Um, we can see it hugely with gender trolling, with every kind of... Um, attack on uh, women in the public eye, with hate speech against feminists who speak out, um, but also with our, our advertising culture, our consumer culture, the kind of what I used to call the red circle phenomenon, all those celebrity magazines where there are circles around huge numbers of parts of women's bodies with you know, an undepilated hair or a small piece of cellulite or hands that are showing signs of aging or you know, whatever kind of terrible misdemeanor um, a woman has committed. This kind of red circle and this idea that you are kind of accountable for all your flaws. Um, and also, other practices of surveillance is just the, the really common practice of um, non-consensual filming. So a lot of upskirt filming um, and very interesting to see the way that 
techniques and technologies that have come from the paparazzi and have come from celebrity culture being taken up and moved across and used ubiquitously just in, in everyday life. So a few years ago in London, we had this really horrible thing, I'm sure some of you will remember this, where um, there was a website formed which was called Women Who Eat on the Tube. And it was for people to upload photographs of these disgusting, abjected, gross women who, you know, commit their most heinous crime of just eating a snack on the tube. And, and the website was just this huge repository of, of terrible attacks on women um, just for eating, just for eating whilst they're on the public transport. Um, and I think that although they're writing in a different context, I think um, Erickson and Haggerty's idea about biometric surveillance, dismantling and disaggregating the coherent body bit by bit is absolutely what happens to women and it's been written about over the years in terms of objectification or cropping, um, but we see it more and more. Um, and it seems as if more and more the body for women is becoming the locus of their, their value. It's becoming a site of kind of self-capitalization. Um, and that's leading to more and more forms of very intensive bodily discipline that yet must be wrapped up in, in discourses of choice. It must be presented as freely chosen, as pleasurable. You know, the word pampering is just used all the time. Pampering, indulgence, that obfuscate the extent to which it's actually normatively demanded. Um, and I think that Angela McRobbie made such a brilliant point in her book, The Aftermath of Feminism, when she wrote about how um, she sort of had this Deleuzean line where she sort of talked about how patriarchy is deterritorialized, that it's no longer, you know, kind of locatable, but that sh she thought that it was actually re-territorializing in the fashion and beauty complex to work to kind of call forth this kind of ever-disciplined female subject. Um, and Anna Elias, who I've been working with, has coined this term nano-surveillance to think about the kind of quality of the surveillance that a lot of women experience today and the proliferation of different forms of gazes and metrics and techniques through which we're invited to know our bodies um, and to know them always through a pedagogy of defect. Uh, and again, a pedagogy of defect that's always already shot through with um, relations of power. So it's going to be very different if you're cisgender versus transgender. It's very different for white women versus women of color. It's very different in terms of fat, in terms of disability. Um, so it's always inflected by difference, um, differences which are hierarchically ranked differences. Um, and this is just something about kind of the way that we, we've come to see the sort of su forensic surveillance of, the, of women's bodies is utterly banal. It's utterly banal. And yet I hope that in, uh, you know, maybe not in my lifetime, but I hope that at some point in the future we'll look back on this period where we see so many pictures like this, so many pictures like this, so many pictures like this um, and we'll start to think what was that you know <laughs> what <laughs> what were we living through what a surreal time where like wh where it became so ubiquitous that i can't walk to work without passing at least kind of five pictures of um women with tape measures around their thighs. I mean, what is this? this uh, am I the only one who thinks this is mad? Wh does anyone else know what's going on in the world? I mean, and this is what we're, this is what we're worried about. Um, but it's just the, the way that you start to see these ideas of metrics and these ideas of surveillance, the magnifying glass, absolutely ubiquitous. And then the one I showed you before where every single part of the face, every flaw on the face or every area of potential flaw um, becomes highlighted. When I saw that poster, and I mean, it had a complete overreaction to it, but it's, it's just around the corner from where I live. And I just, I was, 
outraged by it. I wanted to uh, throw a brick through the window, to be honest. I just thought it was just so awful and just thought about the impact that that would have on so many women that would be walking by that poster every single day. Still up, no one's thrown a brick through the window. <laughs> so it, it, this is, I was just trying to say something about this kind of context of surveillance into which these apps are inserted. Um, all of these kinds of appearance apps. And I just want to go through um, some of the different types of apps that I've identified. So there are, these are the five types, and there are lots and lots of hybrids as well. Um, so at the kind of like more innocent end of the spectrum, I guess, are the apps that will be your own personal beauty advisor. So it's on your phone. You're just standing at the bus stop, and you think, oh, I wonder wonder what I'd look like if I had blonde hair. I wonder what I'd look like if, um, if I actually had like the ideal shaped eyebrow instead of the eyebrow that I've just got. Um, and so you just upload a photograph and then it tells you what your perfect you know, eyebrow arch would be. Um, or it tells you how to accessorize um, an outfit or how to color match or what sort of manicure would look good on you, what nail polish color, everything that you can imagine, every kind of aesthetic decision that you could imagine is encoded into these. And there are hundreds of thousands of these apps, hundreds of thousands of just this personal beauty advisor. They have a very intimate tone. They present themselves as like like women's magazines do. It's like, we're your friend, we're going to help you make the best of yourself and uh, optimize your capital. Then the selfie modification apps and filters. Again, absolutely ubiquitous. Um, there are many, many, many tens and thousands that you can buy. Um, but of course, we all know that filters are now often built into the reverse camera functions of the technology of the phone itself. Um, and they're also there for your use on Instagram and lots of other image sharing sites. Um, and what these apps do, um, again, I think they've just become completely taken for granted so quickly, um, is they allow you to improve your photographs, enhance your photographs so that your photographs look you know, look, look very different. Um, you can make your teeth look whiter, this one. Um, you can add pounds, lose pounds through skinny pics. Um, and it's got this tagline, which I find particularly chilling, that it's our little secret, um, which oh, just seems to be a kind of phrase that is redolent of, of kind of child abuse and child sexual abuse. Um, so you can uh, shave off 15 pounds from your, your uh, photograph and then upload it and no one need know. Um, you can swipe to erase blemishes, you can brighten dark circles, you can reshape your entire face. Um, you can change from this to this. So I think there are lots and lots of questions that we have to ask about them. They're they're really, they've really become normalized and we've started to take these apps completely for granted, maybe use them ourselves. Um, so there's questions about who gets filtered out and what gets filtered out. And building on Jill Walker Retberg's work, we also need to ask about um, the ways in which these filters are cultural as well as technical. So they're cultural filters because they filter our vision through the lenses of neoliberalism, I would say, and also post-feminism and also post-race ideologies. And in terms of race, there's a really troubling racialization that happens in these apps and a very profound privileging of whiteness. And we've seen that historically in terms of um, film and the way that um, film had a kind of whiteness bias. Um, so it was less good at capturing darker skin tones. And now we see it here in these apps in this kind of emphasis on whitening. And some, some of the apps use the word whitening. Many of them use the word brightening. But that's a kind of a little bit of a, um, yes, an obfuscation. Um, so there's, there's a definite emphasis on whitening within these apps, and that's 
built into the app. It's one of the most common features and one of the most used. And given what we know geopolitically about where many apps are produced, Japan, Korea, um, it's not surprising perhaps that there are also face reshaping technologies and ideologies that are built into these apps. So globally, when you look at um, data about who's using these apps and what they're doing with them, you can see that nose reshaping and eye reshaping are amongst the most popular things to do. So absolutely clear kind of racial ideologies being um, built into these apps. And also the importing of ideas from evolutionary psychology. And then, then these ideas, things like you know, hip to waist ratio or facial symmetry, these sorts of ideas, then themselves become kind of underwritten by an algorithmic authority so that they end up more strengthened and seeming to have more facticity than they did before. Um, I think that's a really interesting question also about the, the use of nostalgic fe filters because there's a, a very heavy use of like, you know, take a photo of yourself, then render it in sepia or something like that or render it into a certain kind of hypersaturated Polaroid color or into a black and white photo. Um, and I'm really interested in what, what that means and what, you know, what that's doing um, in, in a certain sense of producing you as a kind of ahistorical subject or lifting you out of your current moment and relocating you um, in a past. Um, and then one of the other really, to me, troubling um, impacts of these is the way that they then get reflected back and taken up in the cosmetics industry itself. So I've put when life imitates artifice, because um, you start to get these makeup sets that are absolutely there to reproduce the photo effects that you've got through these digital filters. So Revlon's photo re um, ready, it promises women that they'll look like photographs that have been digitally enhanced. So it's just like you see it it's like this feedback loop that goes back into um, life. Um, and also very interesting, I think, is the way that they disavow the labor that they incite. So Skinny Picks, as I mentioned, says nobody need know. It's our little secret, and it offers itself as a source of inspiration. So it's not just designed to make you look better or thinner in that particular photograph, but it's actually to, to motivate you to motivate you to um, try to lose weight. So third type of app um, is the, the virtual makeover um, app. So these are really oh, horrible apps <laughs> that, um, that basically they offer themselves to you as tryouts for different forms of cosmetic surgery. Okay, so do you ever wonder what you'd look like if you had whiter teeth and a brighter smile? Um, well, you can find out because um, you can upload your photo and the photo will um, give you the results if you'd had particular kinds of work done on your teeth, on your breasts, on your skin, on your nose, on your cellulite, on basically anything. Um, so Plastic Surgery Simulator Lite looked at it um, a long time ago, actually about 18 months ago, at that time it had had 5 million downloads. This is not a kind of minority pursuit. Um, it's probably more like 10 million by now. Um, and it says, how would you look with a different nose, chin, breasts, buttocks, or with less weight? Um, and Face Touch Up invites visualize the new you. Um, and it says that it's the virtual plastic surgery tool you've been waiting for. Now, what's really interesting now and is massively developing so quickly is the way that these apps use the um, location tracking facilities of our phones to then send us push notifications. So say you've just, you know, you've tried out one of these um, things, you're going to going to get a nose job for whatever. And then suddenly you just like getting all these push notifications from surgeons nearby you. And it's like, two for one and why don't you bring a friend as well and you know um, and they yeah so they they can target you based on place they can target you based on um, the kind of 
uh, change that you're perhaps looking for. Um, and it's very interesting going into the sort of like um, other side of those apps where, where they actually address the surgical community because they very much offering themselves as a kind of portal to get more clients. So the apps are absolutely designed to bring more clients through the door of the cosmetic surgeons. Um, results that they <laughs> offer, not always subtle. I think we can agree. <laughs> Um, so two more types of apps to speak about briefly. So surveilling the self. Um, these are apps that kind of, they blur a little bit with health apps because um, they often sell themselves in terms of this could be a life-saving app for you. So the sorts of things that they do are they allow you to use the scanning capacity of your phone so that you can actually scan your body. Um, and so maybe you've got a mole that seems to be perhaps changing, changing shape. You haven't had time yet to go to the doctor and get it checked out. You can um, see whether or not that is likely to be a precancerous mole. Um, or you can subject your whole body to one of those terrifying things that kind of shows up the sun damage that you've already done, that you've already experienced. And... Um, shows you under a particular kind of UV light. Um, you might maybe don't have any broken veins, perhaps you don't have any broken capillaries, but um, they will be there. It's just you can't see them with the naked eye. So you can use your phone with a helpful app like Sofa Vein. You can scan your body and you can see which of your veins are likely to become broken veins. Um, you can do things like, you know, we all know the characteristics sort of um, aging effect of smoking, especially around the mouth. You can scan that, scan for, s for um, smoking damage. And of course, all of these um, apps, they then promote themselves as um, ways for you to engage in all kinds of anticipatory labor to offset or mitigate the damage that you've already done or that um, you, you will be experiencing. Um, oh yes, dental, uh, dental decay as well is another area. Um, and it's quite interesting how they build from the authority of um, medical and health discourses. They, they claim to have this kind of very serious, this could save your life kind of um, ethic. But when you look at it, you know, not many people do actually die from cellulite. Um, so some of them are a little bit more dubious. Um, and of course, I, I've mentioned that they call forth anticipatory labours. Above all, they call forth anticipatory purchases, of course, um, to offset this damage. And final type of app I wanted to mention, the aesthetic benchmarking apps. Oh, dear. Um, so you find out how old do I look, how ugly am I, how heavy am I, how fat do I look, how fit do I look, how pretty do I look, how successful do I look, how yummy am I, how perfect am I, how suitable am I. You can find out all of these things by uploading photographs of yourself to these apps, which will then give you the results. Um, so this is the kind of thing that they do. Golden beauty meter. Do you ever wonder if you're ugly and your friends just don't tell you? Um, <laughs> interesting. Um, there's so much to be said about the intimate form of address that these apps use and the way that they present themselves as your honest best friend. You know, your friends, your actual friends are not really your friends. The apps are your friends because they will tell you the truth about yourself. Um, obsessed with facial symmetry, absolutely obsessed with it. This was actually how I got into this entire research project was because I was doing some interviews with my colleague Anna Elias and we we just started coming across young women that were uploading their photos to these, these um, symmetry sites of which there are thousands um, to just see if they can kind of get this perfect symmetry and, so, and it's a weird endeavor because you know you sort of think well your face is your face but so perhaps you know doing it a couple of times yes but maybe there's nothing much to be gained by doing it say 50 times because it's still but and yet they were they were trying to improve their scores on these uh, facial symmetry sites by uploading their photos. 
um, complete obsession. I thought this was interesting, obviously because it's a man, it's Hugh Laurie, um, but also I think because it shows the sort of level of detail and it gives this feedback. He's, you want to know his score, he's 8.69 out of 10 and here's why. His face has good horizontal symmetry. The ratio of his nose to ear length is nearly ideal. The inner ocular distance is too big for your eyes. The nose is too wide for your face width. Face is too narrow and too long. But the ratio of your mouth width to your nose width is nearly ideal. And so those kind of judgments come out as a score of 8.69 out of 10. But I just thought it kind of it showed something about the detail of, of these kinds of types of feedback. So just some observations about these before I conclude. So they're based on, on a kind of benchmarking of attractiveness. So it's around hotness, it's around age, it's around attractiveness. They're hugely popular. Um, they're based on ideas like the golden ratio that comes from maths that's used in architecture. Uh, it's a kind of equation for ideal proportions. They're also really based problematically on ideas from evolutionary psychology, as I mentioned. The comments that they offer, I think, are, are really interesting because they don't just give you a score, they actually give you a comment. And the comment is, the term that we've used to describe the comments is warmly couched hostility. And it's, it's, a, it's such a distinctive tone. Um, it's, it's like kind of this friendly, take down. It's like this warm, intimate kind of put down and insult. It's a very, very particular kind of tonal quality. Um, so it's things like, you're so ugly that the mice are jumping on their traps when you come into the room. You know, like mice are jumping into m mouse traps because they're so appalled by your um, ugliness. Or you're so beautiful, you make Athena jealous. Um, these sorts of comments, they're always, they try to be a little bit witty, but they're so brutal, so, so brutal. And again, there's like these links with the, the um, surgery industry developing. So maybe it'll tell you that like the reason that you scored so low is that you've got dark circles under your eyes. So, you know, maybe you could go and have like eye bag removal or maybe it was your skin and you could have microdermabrasion or something like that. Um, yeah, just have this, if you can imagine an app around aesthetic <laughs> monitoring, it probably already exists. Um, scalp aesthetics? Really? <laughs> um, so just con to conclude, I've tried to argue that these apps encode really troubling ideas about race, about gender, about age, about fat, about disability. They're constantly in the business of producing new forms of defect and new, new kinds of problems that we didn't even have a language for before. And I thought it was quite ironic that some of the new problems that they generate are actually generated by the apps themselves. So this, this new beauty problem called Tech Neck, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's basically, it comes from overuse of the mobile phone when you're kind of like holding your head in a particular way and then you get very deep wrinkles in your neck. So it, they actually produce, it's like they have these iatrogenic diseases, but then they have the solutions for them. Um, and then they, I'm just really, really interested and deeply troubled by the way that they intensify and extensify and accelerate um, forms of surveillance of women's bodies, uh, but also produce new forms of surveillance of the female body. And I think this is really historically unprecedented that we haven't seen this degree of scrutiny of the self and others in, in earlier eras. And I'm p particularly interested in what that does to our ways of seeing. So, um, wonderful book by John Berger, uh, ways of seeing, absolutely fantastic piece of work, really, really influential, and his idea of men look and women appear, women watch themselves being looked at. But it seems like now we're living in a moment where there's absolutely new modalities of looking, and um, you know, people are talking about the blink, the grab, the glance, um, the, the way that new visual literacies of the face are 
developing. Um, and Alison Winch is talking about moving on from a kind of panoptic notion of surveillance from Foucault to thinking about a gynoptic form of surveillance, which is about sort of um, mutual regulation among women and by women. Um, Hayward's talking about neoliberal optics. Um, Sarah Riley and her colleagues are talking about a distinctive post-feminist gaze. I think it's really, really interesting what these apps do to our way of seeing. And I notice that um, I just don't have the degree of visual literacy that, say, my students have because they've been brought up in a culture where they're used to surveying each other's faces in a forensic way. And I realise that my, my whole way of looking at people's faces is much more of a kind of a glance, um, whereas theirs is much more kind of forensic and metricised in and of itself. So interesting to think about new ways of seeing just thinking about the different forms of authority that they draw on, some sort of like health authority, science authority, data, dataism, um, the kind of tonal quality um, of these and as a way of selling um, and yeah, as a way of yoking intimate friendliness with body regulation, really troubling. And then there's just like, I've just talked about the apps themselves, but I haven't said anything about how they're being used. Um, what are they being used for? Um, what are the relationships with the cosmetics industry, with big pharma, with the surgery industry? How are people using them? How are they um, resisting them? What kind of force do they actually have? So I've got more questions than answers, but I just thought it was a, a kind of different take on a sort of gendered metric culture. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. so much for us for such a rich and interesting and very thought-provoking uh, presentation thank you so much so i'm gonna open straight away the floor for some sorry for some questions um and Katie, could you please uh, get this side and i'll get the other one thank you uh, so any questions here thanks Roz. really 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 interesting and um thought-provoking and depressing um <laughs> I wonder if you consider in your work the other, f I mean, I, I totally understand and know myself from my own work that apps are incredibly conservative, incredibly conservative um, digital software artifacts. But I'm wondering if you're thinking about beyond apps related to physical appearance, the sort of social media sites where there are lots of different forms of resistance to this kind of beautification is happening, say Tumblr, Twitter, where Fat activism, for example, is yeah. is happening, um, or even on the other extreme, pro-anorexia is happening, where very extreme forms of human embodiment, including female embodiment, are represented and shared, and often organised around hashtags such as body positive hashtag or bad fatty hashtag, and very resistant practices which often involve self-representation, using selfies, for example, or asking people to take photos of you. So there's, a f there's the Fat Fashion February hashtag where fat people stride out in their best-looking fashion in, you know, contra distinction to how they should be, you know, the bad should be unattractive. They're actually saying, here, is, here am I looking very well-groomed and attractive in my best clothes, for example. Um, and women, and another example is women taking selfies of breastfeeding to represent the female body is in a very positive way, performing that kind of function, caring function and caring role. So I'm just wondering if you, you do incorporate those more, you know, just to be on a more positive note, uh, the, the other ways that <laughs> new forms of digital media can work to actually generate and circulate alternative representations of, of bodies, and particularly women's bodies. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah, thank you for that. As, that is really important to to kind of keep in mind that there is resistance. Um, and yeah, I am. I'm really interested in those because I mentioned that I'm I'm interested in confidence and I'm writing a book around kind of positive psychology and body confidence at the moment. And also kind of looking at the way that those those ideas then themselves become appropriated by you know the Unilevers, the Doves, the, the L'Oreal's of this world um, and offered back in a much, a much less radical way 
Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, and the kind of plus size model phenomenon, of course, is, is, is at the moment really having an impact on fashion. How tokenistic it is, I don't know how long it'll last, but yeah, for sure, it's really important to bear that in mind. Um, thanks so much for that, Roz. It was a fabulous talk. I'm up here. Um, I, I guess I was just wanting to ask about um, how you or what kind of research you've done on terms of how the individuals that are kind of encountering these uh, coded messages are receiving them and, and, and to what degree uh, there's an ephemerality there in terms of, um, th you know, these being very clearly normatively coded, but yet sort of approached as being quite playful and 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 you know uh lasting for short periods of time of interest um and then kind of I, I just wonder how they yeah how they get kind of embedded in everyday relations and um whether and also what kinds of um groups are actually using these kinds of apps and and how frequently and and you know the kinds of numbers of figures behind them whether that's possible to access that kind of information yeah, r really great question. And I would love to get some funding to research the uses and the uptake and the resistance um, instead of just looking at the apps. I mean, it came out of a piece of research that Anna and I were doing um, uh, that wasn't wasn't actually about apps, but that's sort of how we got into it, as I was mentioning, because of this um, couple of women that were obsessed with these kind of symmetry, these facial symmetry sites. But one of the things that... Um, came from that research more generally was that even without these metrics women were experiencing themselves as under this kind of intense kind of surveillance all the time and they talked about um, feeling that there was like this checklist gaze one of them used the phrase there's a checklist gaze that whenever she met somebody she felt as if they they literally just scanned her body either from from bottom to top or from top to bottom almost like they were in a, in that instant just like checking off all these features and and the way that she spoke about it in the interview was that she sort of like said that sometimes she would feel that she'd passed that scrutiny and then she kind of went and they went next you know as if it was this sort of robotic thing so on the one hand i'd definitely want to emphasize that these practices of surveillance precede metrics and they're also outside metrics on the other hand like just from talking to my students i've just finished teaching a gender sexuality and media class that the, the issue of whether they're ephemeral and whether they're playful, I think it's really an issue. And sometimes they are, and they talk about, you know, putting cat ears and cat whiskers onto their selfies and doing all kinds of fun stuff. But they also talk about the horror that they feel and real kind of upset that they feel when they get tagged in a photo by a friend on social media and they don't like how they look in that photo. And that doesn't feel like it's a really kind of light, ephemeral thing. It feels like it's quite a source of pain for them. So there's just so much to explore. <laughs> uh, we have space just for one more question, please, before we move on to the next uh, panel. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for your uh, talk. I enjoyed it. And I was thinking of... Um, of uh, sort of historical examples like new media, uh, or you could say that, that 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 the body has always sort of been part of the new media technologies of its time. If you think of Hollywood and film industries and television and magazines, etc. Um, so um, so this sort of embodied subjectivity that sort of um, enmeshed in technology. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what, what, how you, how you see what's happening today, how that's different from what has happened in historically. Definitely, there's sort of the visual side that you that you point to, but there's also in your when you're talking about sort of how you can feel offended by tagging and these things. That there's some, something non-visual at play here, uh, at play here as well. Mm. I think that. Um yeah, I wouldn't want to go get into a sort of like a moral panic about the technology. And I sort of totally get the the point about that there's always been concerns about all, you know, film, video, um, all of our technologies over time have generated that. But I think that with with these kinds of technologies, it, 
to me, it's something about the kind of uh, magnification capacities and the capacities for really intense scrutiny that mean that we are actually seeing ourselves and being invited to see others in this in really, really intensified way, which I think sort of ex it, it extends from the kind of the tape measure, the magnifying glass to just when you see like, yeah, young people using phones and they're constantly magnifying their photos so that they're zooming in on how does that spot look and has it been covered up? I think that, that, that those sorts of capacities are quite new historically and I don't think we understand fully what they mean yet. Okay, thank you so much uh, Rose again for such a fabulous uh, presentation.